Who here has heard of Shodan? Keep your hands up. Um, who's actually logged in to Shodan and utilized Shodan? Oh, there's a few. Um, who's actually logged in with like a paid account and tried to use some of the features there? Oh, there's, so there's a few, yeah, okay, good. Uh, for those who haven't heard of it, uh, are you familiar with Nmap? Um, yeah, it's that badass tool that Trinity used in their hacking session in Matrix Reloaded. <laughs> she totally rocks it um, and hacks a power grid of a city when she finds a vulnerable SSH server. Then she uses the SSH1 CRC32 exploit from 2001. And I love it when that whole city just kind of like shuts down, right? However, as cool as that may be, I would warn against using Nmap unless you totally know what you're doing. From the nmap.org website, we can see that using Nmap, in rare cases, you can get sued, fired, expelled, jailed, or banned from your ISP. <laughs> so when I first heard of Shodan, I have to admit I was apprehensive to use it considering what I'd heard about Nmap, especially when casting a net as wide as uh, uh, indexing the entire internet. But to be very clear, Shodan is not Nmap. Shodan was created by the self-described internet cartographer John Matherly. He conceived of the idea in 2003, which is about 16 years ago now, and he, sh he launched Shodan in 2009. And you can find him on Twitter as a Killian. So just like with books, someone has to organize the library of all this information. What Shodan does is to index all of the devices that are connected to the internet. So basically what we're working with is Google for all of the devices connected to the internet as opposed to all the content. Shodan crawls the internet um, IPs continually and randomly from data centers all over the world. And the base unit, basic unit is this banner that's returned from the device. So headers in Apache, those might be familiar to some of the people in the room, but there's also banners that come from things like industrial control systems. And this data is decorated with metadata, such as the host name, the um, operating system, and the geolocation of that device. So what is actually indexed? Of course, there's web servers. However, that's only about 10% of the internet. There's also databases like we would expect. However, there's been an explosion of these IoT devices like webcams and watches and many other personal devices. So speaking of Internet of Things, have you heard of this one? It's stupid. You leave your dog in an internet connected box outside a business, what happens when this thing's unplugged or power goes out or it's dumb? <laughs> There's also a drone on the market now that picks up dog poop throughout the whole city. No shit. <laughs> so industrial control systems, this was one of the most interesting things I learned when I was doing the research uh, for this talk. Um, there's many pieces of complicated industrial control systems that are connected to the internet. Um, so before there were, um, before the internet, like the companies would pay these highly skilled people to drive out to where the systems were, which they would have to pay them their, this really high rate where they were just driving, right? So they wanted to use the internet, this newfangled thing, to pull everything in to get an economy of scale and start working on things. But they did this before there were um, these wonderful inventions like things like Linux or whatever. So a lot of times it's proprietary operating systems that they've created and they do all these things and these are all connected to the internet, which is a little bit scary, right? Um, so the easiest way to get started with Shodan is to just go to Shodan.io. If you scroll down on the home page a little bit, there's a sample report on Heartbleed. Um, however, let's take note of the number of vulnerabilities that I found when I took this screenshot when I first started doing a talk similar to this in 2017. So when I did my first uh, Shodan talk at a conference, there was 237,000 results of Heartbleed. And that was, what, three years after Heartbleed came out? It was 2014-ish that they, that came out? So let's actually go to, um, to Shodan. Let's check this out. So if we scroll down on the home page a little bit, there's a sample report here. Conference Wi-Fi, always helping me out. So um, today the number is down to um, 91,000 from that 237,000. So our people are doing a really good job. We can actually click and start drilling into this report. So I can look at that and I can see just the ones that are in the United States. 
And once this loads, I'm going to have more options to drill down um, another level. It'll load. Are people watching Netflix back there? <laughs> right. You're going to take my word for that. It works. Okay, so this is a small excerpt from the book written by John Maddeley uh, on Shodan, and the emphasis is mine. Uh, I fully expected that what this was doing, because this is what I did back in 2014, was that it was simply looking at the headers to see if the operating system version was one that would have like an open SSL uh, um, vulnerability, but that's not what it's doing. It's actually, um, let's see. For the test, the crawlers only grab a small overflow to confirm that the service is affected by Heartbleed. Uh, however, it doesn't grab enough data to, do, uh, to leak the private keys. So the ones that are listed on here are the ones that truly have Heartbleed. It's not like the tricks that we were doing uh, at that time to just see if like, you got an uh, open SSL version. It's actually seeing if you have uh, Heartbleed. So we can see the numbers from when I started researching this talk. Uh, what I was going to try to do is drill down to this to actual number live in front of you, but it was going kind of slow. So when I started doing this talk, it was 145 uh, um, uh, servers inside of Kansas City. Today it's down to 36. In Overland Park, which is on the Kansas side of the Kansas City area, it was 195, and now it's down to 22. Uh, I'd like to think that I helped uh, a little bit in helping this number da go down because I reached out to my friends that work in the Kansas City uh, community that work at these companies and said, listen, you are listed on this website as having, uh, being vulnerable to uh, Heartbleed and actually like uh, exchanging uh, data on the internet, so you should probably get that cleaned up. So yeah, no consulting fee, I just did that because uh, it was the right thing to do. So the next killer feature is maps. Uh, you can only get this in the paid version, um, but Based on the time that I have, I'm uh, probably not going to jump into this one, but I am going to jump into this one. Um, the other thing that Shodan does is it grabs images from devices that warrant it on the internet. So this is probably a bad idea to do in front of a room of a bunch of people. Uh, so, uh, I mean, supposing that it actually uh, is going to load, I'm going to do it anyways. <laughs> so I call this YOLO clicking. Oh, uh, we didn't get anything. Uh, too racy or whatever. Um, so these are webcams that are open to the internet, and the search that I did was just a search for HTTP. Um, there are other searches you can do. Um, they changed this, or um, I think it was actually due to someone actually uh, tagging things. What I used to do in this talk is I'd type in Windows, right? And everyone was like, oh, we're going to get uh, to see like Windows servers. And actually, there was a lot of webcams that actually were looking out Windows. Um, but let's actually search for Windows here. So what you do see is uh, different places where you can log on to people's Windows servers. Probably not a good thing to have um, just open and that easily accessible on the internet. So the search language itself is very similar to what I think of when I think of like Solar or Elasticsearch where you got these name value pairs, or even if you're into Google hacking where you can kind of um, control the search by saying, not am I just looking for this uh, thing, I'm looking for this thing to be this thing. Some of you may be aware that Krebs on security was attacked in the fall of 2016. Uh, this was a distributed denial of service attack where uh, a bunch of IoT services came and actually uh, like, um, basically used him as a target. Uh, actually, Krebs reported not too long after that that the botnet uh, code has been released. So that probably means that this is continuing to happen um, regularly because there's probably a lot of IoT services that are out there that are not secured. So this is probably something that's actually happening um, and we just don't hear about it as much. So if we want to, we can go look at IoT devices. So we can look at people's smart panels, uh, printers, uh, traffic controllers, um, all kinds of stuff that is uh, out there, uh, people's Chromecasts. Um, and available over the internet. Now hopefully they have um, some form of authentication or something that is keeping uh, people out of them, but not necessarily. Uh, in March, seven, uh, March 2017, there was the Vault 7 WikiLeaks release that detailed how the CIA performs uh, electronic surveillance and cyber warfare. In these documents, it was made uh, ever more obvious that um, Telnet is on by default in Cisco devices, just kind of across the board. 
right? Um, and over 300 different models. By sending a malformed CMP, which is a cluster uh, management protocol, arbitrary code, can be executed from outside of the system to gain full control of the machine. So Cisco's um, response to this is simply turn off Telnet. All right, let's go look. Um, so if I do a simple search inside of Shodan, I can see uh, the Cisco port. I can, I'm searching for Cisco, just the fact that it's a Cisco device, and port 23 is open. And from 2017 to today, we've actually gone down by about a third, but there's still 20,000 that are um, open and out there. If I do a simple search just on Telnet, uh, basically on the ports of 23, uh, 1023 or 2323, which are the common ones that people use for Telnet, I can see that um, when I started doing this talk two years ago, there was over 5 million, and there's now, at least we're trending downwards, we're just under 5 million, but there's still 5 million devices that are out there on the internet that have the Telnet port open. Like seriously, close port 23, only have port 22 open, and use SSH for all communication like this because you're leaving yourself vulnerable. In the talks that I've seen, John Matherly um, explains that the original intent for Shodan was to do this market research, right? He was thinking that companies like Cisco and HP would be able to like, look up and see what their users are using, what those common configurations are and stuff. Now, I don't know if it's used for that exactly, but um, in the talks that I've had after doing a talk like this, a lot of times, I really think that it would be awesome to work with somebody, and this has never to totally come to fruition, to man manage this data with other big data and create some type of alert beacon that like, tells companies, hey, listen, you have port 23 open on your Cisco. Like, that's not good. Like, uh, that's come out from the CIA that like they're watching you, but the, like now the bad guys are probably watching you too. Uh, but it hasn't. I, so I'm I'm totally open to having that conversation with anybody afterwards. Okay. Shodan's fun tool, great. You can check on people's webcams. But how does that relate to me? I'm here at a DevSecOps conference, um, and I want to figure out how to make my company better. Uh, well, you're in luck because that's actually uh, what I came here to talk about. But I wanted to make sure you knew what Shodan was first. Um, what I, my, my tool of choice is GitLab. If you use Jenkins or whatever, most of what I'm gonna do is simple bash stuff. So you can utilize these type of things uh, in your um, pipelines. For those that wanna follow along at home, this is the point where you may wanna go to gitlab.com slash Aaron Blythe uh, slash Shodan underscore pipeline. You can take a picture or whatever. Um, so I submitted to this conference a general talk that I do on Shodan. Uh, because I wanted to come down to Austin, pretty much. I don't want to see James, right? Um, which up to this point, most of the stuff I've talked about is like that, that previous talk that I've done. Um, so I'm sorry, that part was kind of already on the internet already. James was like, what if you do Shodan for DevSecOps, since that's like the, what this conference is about, right? So I thought, uh, sure, someone likely has done that. So I start Googling around, and I haven't found any like libraries that just make this easy. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna build it from scratch. We're gonna do that together. Um, so in this, uh, in this repository, there's some markdown files where um, I've been doing software for longer than I'm gonna say how many years or whatever, uh, long time. Uh, so what I did was I actually um, did stream of consciousness in a markdown file. Everything I did to build this in two hour, two, two hour sessions. Just sat down, started typing it up, and I kept notes of what I did and the mistakes. So if you want to, you can go see like the way that someone that's been doing uh, software for like two decades still goes through this like process of making mistakes. It's uh, pretty neat stuff. Please don't download it because I do want to open a couple more things. And I made the mistake of putting the uh, slides on here, and we've already seen that the Wi-Fi is not going to handle all the things I want to do. But I want to do a couple more things before we're done. Okay. Um, so this is a com uh, conference about DevSecOps. So I want to break this down into three use cases. So usually we think of DevSecOps like this. Uh, but in all actuality, it's probably like this. Uh, that's not necessarily better or worse. It's just different. Okay, so the three use cases are dev, sec, and ops. So the dev cares about the app that they're responsible for. These are my assumptions. You may have different things that you care about, so we'll work on that. Um, sec cares about the securing the entire organization, and ops cares about the infrastructure that they're responsible for. So first I'm gonna take uh, sec the security use case. And I'm gonna think of this as though you have responsibility for the entire company or um, your organization. So we take a look at Shodan and we start by doing what I was uh, trying to do before where I, I just did a search on the US, then I did the city of Austin, and then I drill down uh, one more level and I select the University of Texas at Austin. So in my GitLab project, uh, I wrote a bash function 
where we do run Shodan for sec. I'm going to send into that um, the University of Texas at Austin. And what it's going to do is go through a loop and find all the, org all the times that um, a machine has been uh, tagged as the organization as the University of Texas at Austin. Then we're going to loop through those and we're going to hit the API and see if there's vulnerabilities. So since we found a vulnerability, then we're going to fail. That's how the pipeline works. And that's the, uh, that's the security. That's like the whole company one. So to be fair, that use case is somewhat contrived. Uh, for a full organization, I would actually use Shodan Monitor. And to do this, you can go directly in the UI of Shodan, and you basically put in the, where the hosts are that you want to take a look at. Um, so you got to do a little bit of research. And then you can set it up so it's going to send you an email each time there's a new vulnerability that comes up in your organization. So as an operation team, uh, you likely know that public uh, address that you're responsible for. And it would be awesome if you could put this in the pipeline with your Terraform or your CloudFormation or your infrastructure as code type of information. And this one's slightly different. This is the run Shodan as ops, right? And instead of sending in the University of Texas at Austin, I'm going to send in this um, uh, IP address that I know. And then it's going to tell me if it found a vulnerability in there. And then again, we fail that build and we don't go forward. Now, this is not perfect and it's not intended to be because it's not going to find the problem before the problem happens but it's also not going to leave you in the lurch for like months of having that out there. So next time you run this pipeline, it'll probably be indexed by Shodan by that point, and you're going to get that information so that you have a smaller window of being open. And some of the sp uh, speakers have already talked about how some of those windows are like years for um, some of the vulnerabilities at some companies. Um, so basically this is one machine, and it had this many CVEs listed. That's a lot. One of them just says heart bleed. Um, so why is this important? By the adversary, you're going to be categorized as a company, right? And we've already talked about like just fixing all your CVEs, that's not the thing that's going to like make you all um, perfect security type of people, right? However, you're going to be categorized by the adversaries. And you don't want to be categorized as that same person as the type of people that like Oh, this person's email address has opened one of those really poorly written um, Nigerian prince emails and like responded to it, right? Like because they're trying to categorize like who are the people that are like get, doing basic cleanliness and who are the people that are like actively telling the rest of the world that they have vulnerabilities. And if you're on this list, then you're probably going to be targeted for more things which are much harder to find. That's why you want to do this type of cleanliness. Um, so, since you don't want to be categorized as that, you have a very simple way. I can't go through all the vulnerabilities in the world, but one of them that I've run into a lot is um, the things that are categorized are simply like the version of Apache that you're using uh, on your uh, machine, right? And if you don't set this um, to server tokens prod and uh, server signature off, you're telling the whole world that you're running Apache version 2.2.4, which is the older one, not the 2.4.2, or whatever. And because of that, that little piece of meta is attached to all kinds of vulnerabilities that are worthwhile to try because you just told the whole world like a piece of information that you probably shouldn't tell them, right? So basic, basic hygiene of not telling the world that. Okay, my third use case, and I'm starting to land here. Maybe I got a, I got a bunch more stuff. Sorry about that. Um, developers often don't know the IP address that they're deploying to, right? So here, I just send in run Shodan dev, devsecopsdays.com, and then I do a dig plus short on that URL. That gives me the host address, and I can send that host address into the API, and then I can do the same kind of check that I was doing from the ops uh, point of view. Uh, also with ALBs and um, Elastic IPs and stuff, you don't always know where you're going to be deploying to, but this is a way like the developer one. And this is the one that I think is the most poignant because uh, this one actually brings things a lot closer. If you're the security team and you're responsible for like all these different dev teams, then you play this game of telephone where you got to tell everybody to go fix things. If you're the dev team and you just put in um, where you're planning on deploying to, awesome. Then I know that I could put a gate in here and just not deploy until we actually fix that up because it's uh, saying we have vulnerabilities, which probably are just metadata type of things we can fix up quickly. Okay, so think of this as a gate that you can add or not add uh, in that Chipotle line analogy that we heard from Matt this morning, right? Hopefully, if nothing else, this gives you an idea of how to stitch a new idea that hasn't been done before as a gate into your pipeline. 
Uh, you have to log in to Shodan to at least do uh, searches. I did not show, but I uh, did have to configure inside of GitLab uh, it to use my Shodan API key. As an individual, you can get access for $59 a month, but there are some limitations um, to do some of the fun things. Uh, since I'm a graduate student, uh, I'm using an educational license uh, right now. Small businesses and corporations can get a few more of the features. Um, this is what I would recommend for your company to do. Shodan's marketing materials uh, boasts that they're 81% of the top um, of the Fortune 100 companies are using Shodan and over 1,000 um, educational institutions. You can pick up the book that I referenced for $5, or if you're like me, I just slid the slider over and, and pay $10 uh, because I think it's an awesome tool. I think now you can actually uh, slide it over to $20 if you want to um, help you know, pay for this service. But, and then sorry, but I have to bring this up. Anytime I tell an entire room this large about this tool, that even myself, I've been incredibly tempted to click on the stuff or go to the addresses that Shodan tells me about. I want you to use this information for positive uh, purposes. Accessing or attempting to access someone else's device could be punishable by law. And I tell you these things so you can protect your own assets. Also, you may think that you're opening a connection to some dummy that allowed their device to be open to the internet. However, it could be that it is someone that's much smarter than you who has a honeypot waiting for you to connect. In the book, there's a very good explanation of how to detect honeypots using the honey score that's available in the Shodan API. And there's a really good section on serial uniqueness. And really, you should buy the book as a companion to the tool. Uh, my name is Aaron Blythe. Uh, I'm terrible at introducing myself. However, I'm working on that, so sorry. Uh, I've been organizing the DevOps KC meetup for the past six years, and I've organized uh, uh, four successful uh, DevOps days in Kansas City. I uh, really appreciate you guys uh, letting me come out here um, to talk. I'm also a graduate student at the University of Illinois, studying uh, as many machine learning classes as they'll let me uh, get into. And I'm on the Twitter and the LinkedIn, so I'd love to meet you uh, if, if you reach out. Um, and also, I uh, have a website. So help me get better. Uh, I just did 60 slides. I didn't see the five minute. All right. I just did 60 slides in 25 minutes, so uh, thanks. <laughs>